In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of Daniel. We're going to continue our study in the book of Daniel. And we just sort of wrapped up chapter 4, so we're going to go ahead and start chapter 5. And you may remember, and I think that this context gives a little help, that King Nebuchadnezzar has been doing this back and forth thing with God, which isn't healthy for him and it's not healthy for his kingdom. That he'll go through these periods where he'll act like a pagan king and ignore God and ignore the blessings that God has given to him. And then God either shows him something or punishes him in some way. And he winds up returning to God and returning to a place where he knows that God really is supreme and starts acknowledging that. And then, of course, the cycle starts over and he falls away and starts acting in a pagan way and, and sort of going back to his old ways of life. And this is really the conclusion of Nebuchadnezzar's part in the story of Daniel. And so we're going to see that play out and we're going to read just the first part of that in Daniel chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Belteshazzar, remember that Belteshazzar is Daniel's name. Belteshazzar, the king held a great feast of a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the, the thousand. When Belteshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and the silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. In verse 3, Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Those of us that are familiar with the way that the story goes knows that it doesn't end very well. But before we even get to that point, I want to bring your attention to this. Do you notice what is going on here? That Belteshazzar, or Daniel, as we know him, and that's his Hebrew name, of course, He's bringing forth these vessels because he's serving the king, and that's the way that this is something that he's supposed to do. And he's specifically bringing vessels that Nebuchadnezzar has raided from the Israelites and taken out of the temple of God, and they are using them to party and drink wine and all this other stuff. That's what they happen to be using at this time. And you'll notice that when he is together with his dinner party and his friends, what they're talking about is the vessels themselves and talking about how amazing they are and how beautiful they are. And this conversation goes away to where they suddenly start praising their gods, gods of stone and wood and gold. And it's really not clear whether they're talking about gods that are made of these things. In other words, they're crafted as idols out of these materials, or it's talking about the gods that specifically reign over those materials, because in the pagan world, e either one could be true. But the point is, regardless of what is actually being said here, it really doesn't matter because they're, they're praising idols that don't exist. And what's hilarious about it is that they're doing so with vessels that were crafted specifically to serve the one true God. They're doing so essentially, by God's own power and authority. Not to say that the vessels themselves are mythical or anything, or that they have special powers or anything like that. That's not the point. What I'm saying is, these vessels were crafted specifically to worship the one true God of Jerusalem, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now, these are being used in such a way that 
people are looking at them in Nebuchadnezzar's household and in his dinner party and praising their own pagan gods. And there's a pretty clear message that I think can be used here. Because I don't think that this is something that really is all that foreign to us. You see, we live in an increasingly secularized world. And what we don't often remember and look back on is that the reason that we have all the modern conveniences when it comes to science, technology, our advancements in human reasoning, the Enlightenment, all of those things are built on the foundation of Judeo-Christian principles. And I think that the way our society is going in a lot of ways actually mirrors what is going on at Nebuchadnezzar's dinner party with the very vessels that were crafted so that people may worship God and to assist them in that endeavor, they are using them for revelry and drunkenness and idolatry. And they're worshiping the created rather than the creator. And ironically, they're doing this specifically because they have built, or they, they have these vessels that were built to serve God in the first place. And that's what's being done now. It actually reminds me of a correspondence between Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine. You see, Thomas Paine had kind of abandoned those pillars, those foundations that we're talking about, the Judeo-Christian tradition and morality itself. And even though Paine really paid homage to God and, and talked about how he had influenced this enlightenment of man early in his writings, as he started writing a little bit later in his life, you could tell he was kind of moving away from that. And Ben Franklin, who was probably the least religious of all the founders, I mean, he was certainly a believer in God, but it, it's hard to even make the case that he was a Christian. He had some doubts about the divinity of Jesus, even though he did believe in the Christian God, and he believed in the teachings of Jesus. And essentially what Franklin says is, how dare you repudiate the foundations that you are benefiting from right now? Because Thomas Paine was living in liberty because of the work of people that believed in God and specifically crafted that liberty so that men would be able to worship God as they chose. And in the same way that people misuse liberty today, in the same way that people abuse the liberty and the freedom and the conveniences and the wealth and everything else that we have been blessed with by God, specifically because our society was originally founded on the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's ironic that they use that very liberty and that same reason and that same logic and that same enlightenment to try to move away from God and to worship other things and worship the creation itself. You see, the truth is, the modern-day atheist is really not much different from the ancient pagan. They both, in many cases, worship nature and worship the things that are created and the things that exist here on this earth as opposed to the God of heaven. And many times they do so on the backs of of those who crafted something specifically to be used for God's glory. You see, in the same way that the gold and the silver and the wood that created these vessels were made by Israelites that did so because they wanted to worship God, you also have to remember that God made the gold and the wood and the stone and everything else to begin with anyway. And really, God was at the center of all of that. And yet you have these people that show no appreciation, no gratitude, and are worshiping the creation, the thing that God made, rather than God himself. They're missing the picture. And they're worshiping really their own wants and desires and gluttony and lust. Instead of being thankful for what they've been given, being humble about it, and thanking God for what he has done for them. And if we, as a society or as individuals, forget that God is at the source of all the things that we are able to enjoy now, that it is God that allows us to reason and to think clearly and to be able to go out and make gain and improve the circumstances of our life, if we lose sight of that, then as a society, we're certainly going to fail. 
and as an individual, we will be eternally lost trying to fill this God-shaped hole that only God can fill. And with Nebuchadnezzar and his dinner guest, who are using these vessels originally intended to worship God, to instead reflect on their own gods and their own self-interest, if we continue down this path, we'll meet the same end that they did. And we'll talk about what that end is in the installment, hopefully tomorrow, when we look a little bit further into the book of Daniel. But the main thing and the main takeaway that we need to remember is that we need to be honest about where all of this came from. And when we look around in the world, we need to not look at it and think about how impressive we are or how clever or skilled we are to be able to, to give ourselves all of these things. We need to remember that all those things, including our abilities and our will and our lives themselves, ultimately they all come from God, and ultimately God is going to be the one that we have to answer to in the way that we reacted to him and treated him and the others around us. That's something that Nebuchadnezzar lost sight of many times in the scripture. And it did not end well for him. Stay the course, friends. Oh, hey. What are you still doing here? Video's over. I'm off the clock, so go watch another one of my videos or something. Or better yet, you could subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. And if you do that, then you'll get a notification when I actually am on the air and you can watch me then. In the meantime, I'm going to take a nap.